Thank you very much. Uh, welcome, everyone, to our talk about exploit generation and JavaScript analysis automation with WinDebug. Uh, we really tried to come up with a longer name, but we couldn't. Um, so, a few notes about myself. Um, I have way too much public information about myself on Google, so just search my name and you will know everything about me. Uh, but I have a wife, a three-year-old son. Uh, my number one hobby is hiking, usually, so I try now to sit every time uh, next to the computer. And I have plenty of unimportant certification and some more useful ones, like the ones from Offensive Security. And Miklos? Hey, so good morning. Um, I'm mostly off the grid, so I'm a kind of uh, paranoid person, so you will not find me too much on, on me on Google, I can promise. Um, just a little bit of information about myself. Uh, yeah, I'm married, I have two kids. And myself, I'm not so much of a cert collector, uh, although I'm, I'm interested in a lot of trainings and I typically do attend them, but the one that potentially is relevant for this uh, presentation is uh, JIAX, uh, reverse engineering malware. So as for hobbies, uh, you know, I'm also kind of the hiker and um, I typically try a new sport every year. Back to Chaba. Thank you. Uh, so our first part of the talk is the automated exploit generation between debug. So we all know at least people who anytime wrote uh, or tried to write an exploit or develop an exploit, uh, how annoying it can be sometimes. So it's a heavily manual intensive process um, to dig into in, inside the debugger. Um, and, and we all know the, the challenges when you, when you start a debugger, you start the process, and you realize that, oh, I forgot to put in the breakpoint. And then you start over, and then you realize, oh, I did a typo in my exploit. Okay, let's start over. Stop the debugger, start the debugger, start the process, attach the process to the debugger, continue, crash it, and so on. Um, it can be really time consuming many times and also frustrating in, in some cases, especially when you are progressing towards the end and you tend to rush. Um, we tend to make more and more mistakes in our uh, little exploit code. Uh, on the other hand, uh, talking about classic buffer overflows, so not talking about kernel exploits or, or difficult heap uh, exploits in, on browsers and heap spring and all these uh, fancy stuff, but if you look on, on classic buffer overflow exploits, it's quite standard process how you really develop uh, an exploit. So you usually start with finding the EIP or finding out that you can control EIP. Uh, what is the offset on your buffer to overwrite EIP? Uh, then you will start to examine uh, the memory layout, how much space you have in various uh, places, uh, which registers point to your buffer. Um, then you will try to somehow jump to your shell code uh, with using one of the registers. Uh, then you will generate the shell code, usually probably with Metasploit, and at the end put it all together and you will get a working exploit. But this is usually, there are some corner cases when you need to come up with some really creative ideas, but if you look the majority of classic buffer overflows, I think this methodology covers most of it. Um, so I was thinking why we cannot automate this entire process. There are tools that are already doing some part of it, like trying to help you to develop uh, exploits, but none of them automating the entire uh, flow. So my goal was to create a tool which can do the entire exploit development for you from a crash till a working uh, exploit, and if possible with zero manual interaction. So I wrote a tool in Python uh, which uses the PYKD library 
And maybe a few words about this one. This library is developed, I believe, by a Russian team. And basically, it allows you to interact with WinDebug directly from Python. Uh, there are two ways to it. You can either run Python scripts uh, with this library inside WinDebug, or it allows you to actually invoke uh, WinDebug, start the process in WinDebug directly from Python. So you don't even need to open WinDebug uh, for anything. And, and it's really helpful. It has a very good and rich API. You can query the values in the register, registers, search the memory, do a whole lot of stuff which, which can help you to explore the environment. And I already released the tool, uh, but we will share the link uh, after the talk. So what the tool can do as of right now, uh, again, this works for classic buffer overflow, so nothing more. It can also bypass ESLR uh, with the method of it will try to look for DLS, uh, which doesn't have the ASR, ASLR flag. So we look for modules where the memory is not randomized upon load. And if you want, it can try to search only those ones for assembly code. Uh, it works for file and network-based exploits. It's important because uh, when you automate it for network-based exploits, you have to start the process, wait a little bit, and then send your exploit. Uh, on the other end, on a file-based uh, exploits, for example, when opening, let's say, an MP3 uh, list file, uh, you need to generate the file and then open the process and load that file to the process. Uh, so the workflow is, is a little bit different. And it can basically develop a, a working exploit uh, from a simple crash. And again, it can automate uh, anything, and you don't have to start in debug. Uh, you can just run this script and it will do everything for you. So how does it work? Um, it will start the process in WinDebug uh, from Python. Uh, it will send in the crash, and I will talk about later on how you uh, give the input uh, to it, how you actually write the exploit so it can work with the tool. Uh, it will find the EIP offset it will analyze the, the memory. It will find uh, registers pointing uh, to your buffer. Uh, it will find all the bad characters, uh, which is not supported by the application or which can uh, make your exploit not work. Uh, it will find ways to jump to your shell code. It will try various methods like uh, jumping to a register, calling the register, or pushing the register uh, value and uh, returning to it. It will generate the shell code. Now, this part is where it uses a uh, Metasploit to generate the shell code. Uh, at this point, it's hard-coded to calc.exe um, as a shell code, but you can essentially replace that line with uh, anything. So, but you need Metasploit to generate the shell code. And it will generate the shell code without, with knowing all the bad characters. And at the end, it will put all to, uh, everything together, and it will uh, successfully run the exploit, and it will also save uh, the exploit for you. So if it's a file base, it will be already saved because the file is already there. Uh, but if it's like a network-based uh, exploit, uh, it can save it for you, so you can use the exploit later on. Uh, I have a demo. We didn't sacrifice any animals for the demo guts, so we decided to go with videos and not with uh, live stuff. Um, so this is where the application start. Uh, let me zoom into. So it will start with sending in a pattern. You probably familiar with this from. Metasploit, it uh, uses its own pattern generator, and it will identify uh, the offset for the EIP overwrite. So let's continue. You can see that it's restarting the application 
uh, in the background. For the demo, I'm using Minishare. It's a very old application like Exploit, but it's very good for demonstration. And then it will start to find uh, bad characters. And, and it will also log you a bunch of other outputs to the screen, so you will have a very rich uh, logged information for later use uh, in case you need. So now it will try to find all the bad characters. Um, it takes a few seconds. It's still much, much faster than doing this um, by hand. So if we zoom into it, so we can see that it found all the bad characters. It for save it for uh, later use. And basically, at that point, it already knows which registers point to your buffer, and it will start to search all of the modules, um, all of the loaded modules for usable assembly instruction, how to jump uh, to your shell code, and by default, it will try to find jump uh, ESP in this case, or jump to the, uh, to the specific register. So let's continue. So let me zoom in one more time. So it searched through all the DLS uh, and it recorded all the memory location where it found uh, usable instructions. And then it will generate the shell code with the use of Metasploit. And basically, at the end, it uh, successfully crashed the application and can launch uh, car. And the only thing uh, I gave to the application initially, it was the crash uh, information. So how do we use this? Uh, so there is some pre-work that has to happen. You cannot just take any POC code uh, that will crash the application and give it to the tool because it cannot interact with it. Uh, I came up with an exploit class and there are some functions inside to it uh, which has to be populated, mainly the exploit function which basically defines how you crash the application. Uh, again, this is written in Python. So basically you have to populate this function in order to work. And the other thing you have to do is you have this self.buffer. The buffer is an internal variable to the class. And that basically, the, it's a list of strings uh, which are the building blocks of, the, of your buffer. So it's mainly split to three places before EIP overwrite, the EIP overwrite, and after the EIP overwrite. Um, Part and the reason you have I have to have this class is because because I have to modify the buffer on the fly um, based on the information I gathered during uh, the analysis. So that buffer is constantly evolving, um, either with the patterns or with the bad characters uh, triage and and so on. And there is another uh, function which have to be populated in case of uh, network-based uh, exploits. That's the save function in case you want to save your exploit for future and why you wouldn't want to do that. And it would be basically the very same uh, function than this exploit. It would be just writing out everything you put here, you write out, you write out the file and you write out also the, the buffer uh, to a file, and that's it. And in case of buffer, um, file-based exploits, you already have the file on the disk, so you don't need to save it uh, additionally. Uh, I tested it with a bunch of applications. I have other videos as well. If, 
uh, and I will post them later on, probably in YouTube if uh, anyone is interested. Um, it works pretty well, uh, reliably. Probably a big challenge is if you need to interact with the application in order to crash it, uh, then it can be a challenge. But generally, it, uh, it works. And for the future, uh, based on this, uh, I plan to add the SEH uh, based overflows because I think these, those can be automated as well. Uh, add more logic to make more tricky jumps uh, to the shell code and maybe also add uh, DEP bypass with generating uh, rope chains um, to the exploit. So that was my part. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Chaba. So, funny thing that Chaba and I both attended the same most awesome Windows exploitation training provided by Coral and where we got our uh, inspiration from. Uh, yet, I'm going to look at a completely reverse angle of it. So, how we could use automation for reverse engineering tasks. So, how many reverse engineers do we have in this room? Hands up. Good. I see a few hands. So, um, now you wouldn't want to waste your time on re reversing non-malicious code, would you? So, what's the workflow? Um, you get some sort of um, hint from a particular code as being malicious, either from a sandbox analysis engine, um, never mind whether it's you know free or uh, commercial, or the level two team from the uh, blue team notices bad behavior. So, once the thing lands on your desk, you need to figure out how it works and um, uh, what it does, what it, uh, whether it's already known or not. And in the case of uh, browser exploiting malware, it comes down to figuring out the JavaScript part of it, isolating the shell code, um, understanding the vulnerability. And honestly, it's quite a time consuming process. And it is coming with a number of challenges. So one of them being is that it can be analyzed in the uh, browser's own debugger, but then you, you have to spend some time figuring out the correct breakpoints you have to set up. Uh, it can be you know, extracted from the uh, page um, and you're using an external uh, JavaScript engine to, uh, to analyze the code and uh, to, to patch it if needed. And uh, last but not least, you have to sometimes deal with the problems of uh, code containing um, anti-debugging or anti-reversing techniques. Thus, word of warning, so we're not going to unleash a one tool solves all problems of your reverse engineering problems, uh, nor are we going to fully automate the whole process. Uh, I don't believe it's, uh, it's entirely possible either. After all, it's uh, called reverse engineering, right? So what we're going to do is um, do a bit of uh, code deobfuscation. And um, the, the methodology goes like, OK, you want to catch the function before uh, the, um, the execute. Uh, you place some sort of breakpoint. If needed, you overload the functions. Um, you locate the exploit code, you, and you understand the shell code. So our approach to this was to put together a tool that can automate the, uh, the, the obfuscation. Now, JavaScript obfuscators use several techniques. Um, variable name mangling, um, character substitutes, function expressions, arrow functions, lambdas, ifies, um, and most often, evals, so evaluates. Uh, Worthy of note that gladly, since JavaScript is, is not a, uh, a class language, uh, you, you don't have to deal with reflections. So, there are a dozen or so JavaScript deobfuscators out there. Um, but we wanted to, to come up with a simple yet effective solution that is solving the issue of reversing natively. So are we going to reinvent the wheel here? Well, maybe, but our wheel is going to be a bit different. So we want to make it impossible for the JavaScript code uh, like the malicious code to figure it ever out that it's being debugged or it's being reversed. Um, we have to, we want to have the malware run in its most natural environment, that is the browser itself. So 
Um, it would be very nice if we could somehow get it to stop at uh, the point where the exploit starts to run and we want to, uh, to have the min minimum manual interaction. So this, this pretty uh, much comes in handy when the JavaScript code is trying to run a, a browser exploit with a heap spray and um, a use after free situation, for example. So, well, breaking out of the, of the jail, you know, breaking out J JavaScript code from the um, from its natural environment doesn't always work as, as good. So why not? You know, why don't we break into it? And the idea is to to harvest the awesome powers of WinDebug and a bit of uh, Python code that goes along with it using the same PyKD uh, WinDebug extension. And uh, you know, the, the code is um, hosted at um, GitHub, we'll, we'll see at uh, the uh, final slide. So it, what uh, can it do for the moment? Uh, it works for, uh, for i11. Um, the obfuscates evil-based code, uh, stops at the exploit, um, each session is being logged to a new file, and uh, most of the, of, the, of the process is fully automated. So, you know, we're, since we want to break into the, the, the jail, um, we want to find the right function. So, um, you know, word of warning, this code has to be maintained in the sense that each um, major version of, uh, of a browser and each vendor has a very different implementation of the JavaScript engine. Obviously, a very different uh, debug symbols that go along with it. So, um, we're going to do, um, to try to figure out the JavaScript engine's um, um, points where actually evaluation is happening, and we're going to use dynamic arguments for that um, to make sure that we don't confuse the, uh, the source code with the, uh, the actual dynamically evaluated code. So, um, you know, finding the, the pointer to the argument is, is, is the next thing. So, you want to make sure that uh, you're trying to, you know, log whatever is being already evaluated, not, you know, uh, uh, the string that goes, uh, um, you know, in there before the, the obfuscation happens. So, once you figure out the, um, the, the argument, you need to figure out the, um, the location to it. And um, I'm not sure how many people are familiar with, uh, with you know, different WinDebug extensions, like Mona, for example, is, is, is one of the great tools. And it helps you a lot with finding, you know, uh, X in memory. But as good as it is, unfortunately, I couldn't figure out for the life of me how it um, uh, could give me in a most um, simple way to get a pointer uh, from the current registers to a memory address. So for, the, for this reason, I created a, um, um, a Python helper application, um, uh, this chain.py. And it works like um, you provide a, the address when you want to um, uh, point to, and then the level of recursion um, or iterations of uh, pointer and the references, uh, the starting register that you want to um, start from, and a, um, a range of, of words that you want to to come up with. So um, this will help you in, in many cases. Most often you will, uh, you will use either the ESP register, well, obviously most uh, things are on the stack, or uh, in certain cases the, uh, the CX, ECX register, which uh, contains a pointer to this. So all in all, um, it's, uh, it's a longer story, but you figure out that the um, uh, the most obvious uh, codes from the uh, from the symbols from uh, Internet Explorer don't point to what you uh, you're after, and you have to dig deeper. So um, at the end of this presentation, the code that we're releasing is not just uh, the code, but also the methodology. So we're pro uh, providing a full tutorial on on how you can actually figure these things out, and later on you will be able to maintain for different browsers. Um, so once you have the logging. Um, breakpoint, uh, you start uh, to, to automate things. Um, I'm not sure how many uh, of you have, you have you tried to debug directly into the browsers. It's not the most e easy thing, and uh, attaching to debugger even is, is not simple. So we put together some um, WinDebug script files that uh, create a, a unique log file for each session, um, ignore the unneeded breaks, make sure that you, you set up the correct uh, um, levels of um, 
exception handling, so you ignore the ones you, you don't really care about, and you only cache those ones that, uh, that you need to. WinDebug syntax is not exactly user-friendly, so I put together one short method to you know, encompass this in a, in a two-liner. And ultimately, you set up the, uh, the breakpoints. So uh, again, time is short, and we didn't pray enough, uh, long enough for the demo, demo gods, so uh, we have here a simple uh, video. So what's, what's going to, uh, to, see, uh, to be here on the screen is the uh, WDS uh, um, file, so the script, the WinDebug script, sets up the breakpoint. Now, this is the, uh, the simplest possible uh, version of you know, trying to figure out um, how eval uh, works. As again, um, you want to have a dynamic uh, um, argument to it, so you don't confuse uh, between source code. Um, so as, as you go further on, um, and it seems to work, then you, you try to go a bit of a stress testing to see if you found the, uh, the correct thing and if it works for, uh, for a, um, a number of uh, quick succession of, of calls to eval. And uh, further on, if you really want to test it, you, you can use an eval bomb um, that does a recursive evaluation until the, uh, the stack overflows. Actually, it will kill the browser. Um, and um, here's a, um, an example of a, a simple um, of obfuscation. So, all it, it needs to do is actually you run this uh, uh, ilog.ps. This is a, a PowerShell script that uh, does the, the automation of uh, attaching to the debugger. And you use your browser as you would normally. So you just, you know, uh, uh, you navigate in, in, in the browser window. And as soon as, as the, the evil starts, uh, it is getting logged um, to, the, um, um, to, uh, to the logger window. So. This is the, um, the first stress test, um, making sure that you know, um, it's, uh, it's, it's able to, uh, to catch up with what's happening and we're not uh, using uh, invalid pointers. And um, here's the, uh, the already deobfuscated code at the bottom of the screen from the, from the next sample and ultimately uh, we can uh, try to see how it, it, uh, it handles um, um, a serious stress test. So basically this is the recursive eval, which is, uh, as you'll shortly see, completely crush the browser. Uh, so you know, it, it can handle even very stressful situations. And um, what you get is, um, um, well, ultimately the, the browser crashes. You get um, a log file out of it, which we'll hopefully see in a few seconds. So you get a, a new log file for uh, for each session that you uh, you run this uh, yeah, evilizer. This is uh, what I named it. So here, here are the, all the uh, all the outputs, and um, yeah, somewhere in the, in there uh, you will see the actual um, deobfuscated code as well. And if if you ever wonder how many times you know the, the browser was able to handle the uh, uh, the recursive evals, and yeah, you can you can see that it's uh, you know. It, it, it's 9,000 times before the, the browser decided to, to fully crash. Um, so this is just the, the, the proof of concept. So now let's, uh, actually, let's see an actual exploit. So uh, this is going to uh, use a um, uh, heap spray with a use after free. Um, so this is the original code uh, I'm, um, that I was working on originally when we uh, experimented with the, with the exploit. And this is a very heavily obfuscated, multiple times obfuscated version of the, of the same code. Um, so I think it's, it's obfuscated like at least three or four times with different mechanisms of, of obfuscation. And again, we're um, firing up the, um, the evilizer. And uh, once we um, open up the, uh, the obfuscated code, 
not only you get the uh, deobfuscated string uh, in the output, and also later on you'll see the log file, but also you're getting a uh, breakpoint into the uh, virtual protect call that is actually uh, the final step in the, in the ROP chain. So, um, you know, it's a bit tricky to, to figure out, you know, how to, um, to, to put together the, the breakpoints for, um, for the virtual protect in order to, you know, differentiate the real virtual protects from the, uh, from the crashes, but uh, that's also going to be released in the, in the code. I don't have time for that. But the point is that it's, it's very nice because um, uh, you get a, at the same time a output of the uh, already deobfuscated code and at the same time uh, you get uh, your hand on the um, uh, point where it actually crashed. So you can immediately analyze the, uh, the malware itself as, uh, as it's trying to, uh, to do its badness. So for future plans, um, uh, we want to document some methodologies for, uh, for Edge and, uh, and Chrome as well. The same thing works uh, pretty much the same. Uh, it's just uh, different symbols. Uh, mind you, uh, if you want to work with, uh, with Chrome, then uh, you have to understand that the, the, the Chrome debug symbols are almost one gigabyte inside. So you, you better have a, a very large uh, virtual memory machine. Okay, and um, here are the source codes. Um, uh, both our parts are released on, on GitHub, so that pretty much concludes the uh, demonstration and uh, today's uh, talks. So if you have any questions. So anybody?